35 years ago, I was the CEO of a vertically integrated international corporation and personally making millions of dollars a year importing and distributing a natural, organic product that was in huge demand. As Zaza becomes more and more popular, so do the stories of those who have historically delved into it. One of these stories is that of the life of Richard Stratton, one of the unlikeliest substance kingpins you will ever hear of. This is the tale of Richard Stratton and the hippie mafia. And if you like Goodfellas, the movie Savages, or Catch Me If You Can, you would definitely love this one. So be sure to stick around to the end. And welcome to the Trap Tree series. Please make sure to hit the like button, share this, and comment down below. Oh, and don't forget to follow us on all the social medias. The links are down below in the description. Anyways, this is LMC. Let's run it. So Stratton is a man who's unafraid to take risks, and some might even call these risks downright foolish. Picture this, he boldly parks a truck brimming with illicit substances right in the driveway of his parents' suburban home, all the while fully aware that the relentless DEA agent has him in their crosshairs. And it's a daring move that would make most people's hearts race, but not Stratton. He's also been known to leave a briefcase containing all of his invaluable personal contacts casually lounging in the backseat of his truck while he pays a visit to a rather shady counterfeiter. Like that wasn't enough with Stratton, found himself wedged uncomfortably between the iron grip of the government and the unforgiving clutches of the mob. And what did he do? He dove even deeper. Becoming an entangled with none other than the infamous Whitey Bulger. It's Whitey who cryptically tells him that sooner or later, a favor might be required. And that singular statement elevates Stratton's self-worth to unprecedented heights in his eyes. He's now convinced that he occupies a pivotal place in this treacherous world of underground dealings. But there's more to Stratton than meets the eye. He's not just the average risk taker, he's also a master of name dropping. He casually tosses around the names of iconic figures like David Bowie, Mick Jagger, and Hunter S. Thompson, even though they have no direct bearing on his own story. It's almost as if he's trying to make it abundantly clear that he operates in the highest echelons of society. This propensity for name dropping may well be rooted in his upbringing, which was worlds apart from his current life. You see, Stratton grew up in the quintessential privileged child in Wellesley, surrounded by affluence and comfort. But there was a longing with him, a desire to shed his soft, privileged image and transform into the tough kid from the gritty streets of Southie. See, what you may wonder pushed him into this daring occupation. It all traces back to his childhood, where the young Stratton spent countless hours in front of the television. He was never drawn to the hero. No, he yearned to be the outlaw, the renegade, who challenged the status quo. His commitment to this value is unwavering. He believes fervently that what he does is a form of defending the quintessential American values of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. To him, it's just a moral obligation to defy tyrannical authority and flout laws that he deems unjust. His rationale? Well, the substances he traffics, he argues, is a creation of God and altering one's consciousness should be an inalienable right in a free society, as long as it doesn't harm others. And I see marijuana as a great metaphor for American democracy at work, where the people said, these laws are insane, they don't make any sense, this substance is a lot less harmful than other substances, and as Americans, we should have an inviolable right to alter our consciousness as we see fit. Where does it say anywhere that the government should be able to come in and tell us how we can alter our consciousness? Before we move on with the content, I wanna say a big thank you to Dr. Smoke for supporting this content right here. So if you guys go to drsmoke.com, use my discount code LMC, you're gonna get 15% off your entire order. And I highly recommend that you, know, you go to Dr. Smoke, order some stuff, they've got high quality stuff, they've got drinks, They've got all different types of goodies, big brands, right? All different types of brands, 3 Chi, all different types of stuff. They've got all different types of candy, right? All super high quality, all tested, all good to go, all legal, delivered to your door. So go to drsmoke.com, use discount code LMC at checkout, get 50% off your order. And also this is gonna help you know support this content here. So if you wanna support the show, Go try it out. Go to drsmoke.com. Use my discount code LMC to get 50% off your order. Now, let's jump back to the content. It's rather intriguing, isn't it? The man boldly employs both God and the American ethos to justify his unconventional career in drug smuggling. 
Now, loyalty is another defining trait of Stratton's character. He holds his friends in the drug trade in high regard, often referring to them by a colorful array of nicknames like the pilot Yogi Bear and the coke dealer Fearless Fred Barnswallow. But alas, not all of this is brethren in arms proved to be as steadfast as him. The Stratton faces the bitter sting of betrayal as the walls of justice are closing in around him. He admits to a touch of self-centeredness, but never once does he label himself as evil. He makes a solemn vow that, come what may, he will never betray his comrades. When I was arrested, the government put a tremendous amount of pressure on me to become an informant. They actually said, we'll let you go if you'll help us set up this person, that person. In a world where the prospect of serious jail time looms large, this declaration of loyalty stands as a noble promise from none other than the prince of the hippie mafia himself. Now enough with the summary, let's go into more details, shall we? Richard Stratton was a clean-cut college student who fell in love with the adrenaline high of cross-border drug trafficking after bringing two kilos of Zaza across the U.S. border from a trip to Mexico. Once he fell in love with the thrill, he never looked back. He became a member of the hippie mafia and lived the underground life. Richard Stratton started in the 1980s as an entrepreneur, and throughout his colorful journey, Stratton encountered a kaleidoscope of personalities, from the esteemed novelist Norman Mailer, with whom he co-owned a horse farm at one point, to the notorious mobster Whitey Bulger. It was a surreal existence, one where he effortlessly straddled the realms of both criminal intrigue and literary artistry. Like most popular drug dealers, Stratton ended up in prison and during his 25-year sentence in federal custody stemming from a 1982 hashish and zaza bust, Stratton refused to let his creative flame be extinguished. Behind bars, he penned a novel titled Smack Goddess and honed his legal acumen, ultimately securing a reduction in his sentence after serving eight years. He leveraged his success into a career as a writer, contributing to esteemed publications such as Esquire, Playboy, and GQ. He even lent his expertise to HBO's Oz and played a pivotal role in the creation of the short-lived yet impactful magazine Prison Life during the mid-90s. In an exclusive interview by Vice, they had the privilege of delving into the intriguing intersection of Stratton's two worlds, the world of the potent pot and the world of the written word, in which he talked about his captivating memoir, Smuggler's Blues, The True Story of the Hippie Mafia. The truth of the matter is, I was always a writer, even before uh, I started smuggling pot. So when in high school and college, that's all I really wanted to do. So that, that I mean, as it's, it's much fun as it was and as interesting and as intense, it didn't satisfy the creative urge that I have. It would satisfy it for a minute and then I'd be wanting to do another one just to get that rush again. But with writing and um, working on TV shows and movies and stuff like that, it's a much different sense of accomplishment. It's a much more profound, deeply satisfying. In this book, Stratton transcends the role of merely showcasing his prowess as a skilled Zaza smuggler. He proves himself as a masterful storyteller as well. As he eloquently puts it, quote, I always had these two lives I was leading a revelation he shared during a conversation with Vice. He went on to humorously claim, quote, I used to tell people I smuggled Zaza to support my writing habit, a statement that rings true given his track record. Now, Stratton routinely raked in staggering sums of money, typically ranging from three to $5 million per smuggling operation, a clandestine dance he performed multiple times each year. Now, during an interview with Vice, he also recounted his initiation into the drug trade and his lengthy tenure as a Zaza and Hashish smuggler. According to him, his foray into the world of smuggling commenced during his time at Arizona State University in the 1960s. He began his operations by transporting Zaza from Mexico into the United States, concealing the contraband behind the door panel of his roommate's truck. Stratton's illicit career spanned an impressive 15 years, stretching from the mid-1960s to the early 1980s when he faced arrest. He reminisced about a particularly daring venture during this period, which involved unloading a substantial quantity of Colombian Zaza from a mothership located off the coast of Maine. Additionally, he revealed an incident where a DC-6 plane crash-landed and his team managed to offload 10,000 pounds of Zaza from the aircraft before law enforcement arrived on the scene. In his words, quote, I was arrested a few days after all that reefer had shipped out of the state to distributors. A total of 40 tons. The DEA's arrival was essentially untimely. They arrived after the fact. Following my night in jail, I appeared in court the next day and managed to secure my release on bail, which amounted to $250,000, end quote. 
However, as the gravity of the situation became increasingly evident, Stratton realized that a member of his smuggling operation possessed an unsettling level of knowledge that was poised to cooperate with the authorities as a witness against him. Faced with this imminent threat, he made the fateful decision to become a fugitive. During this period of evasion, Stratton eluded capture for a duration of nearly two years. His escapees during this time took him to Lebanon, where he orchestrated a massive hashish smuggling operation that saw a staggering 15,000 pounds of the substance brought into the port of New Jersey. During this time on the run, a relentless DEA agent named Bernard Wolfshine was hot on his trail. They formed this crazy task force called Sentec, with folks from the FBI, DEA, and IRS, all aiming to catch this group of smugglers they called the Hippie Mafia. Now, this gang included not just Zaza and hashish smugglers, but also folks making and selling psychedelic stuff. Still, uncovering during the interview, Stratton also provided insight into the complex dynamic between himself and Agent Wolfenstein, highlighting how their cat and mouse relationship evolved over the course of his escapades. In his words, quote, When I got arrested, there was a particular DEA agent involved in my case who becomes a major character in the book. It was like the catch me if you can story where you've got these two people, an agent and an outlaw, and you can see how their relationship evolves. In addition to his fascinating books, Stratton also mentioned that he had also played a big role in starting Prison Life magazine. He didn't just start it, he became the boss, the editor, and the one who makes sure it gets printed. I started a magazine called Prison Life magazine that was written by and illustrated by people who were still locked up. I came to believe that a lot of these young guys who were being locked up were very creative people. Kids who came from the ghetto who didn't have any other way of expressing their creativity fell into crime. So I, I became a, a, an activist around these issues of prison culture, prison violence. What makes this magazine special is that all the stories and pictures inside are made by people who were in prison or used to be in prison. So it's like getting the inside scoop from the people who know it best. He said, they held this super cool contest every year called, quote, Art Behind Bars. And it was like a big creative showdown. Artists, poets, writers, and storytellers. The winners of this contest got their stuff published in the magazine. Now, in the Vice interview, when they asked him about High Times, he said it was started by a guy named Tom Forcade. And guess what? Stratton had worked with this guy too. Tom wasn't your average guy. He used to smuggle a certain green plant. You know what I mean? Stratton and Tom did some business together and Tom was like a genius in the world of secret newspapers. Here's the really cool part. Tom was a big deal in the whole movement around the green plant, and he was also a key player in the secret newspaper world. And it turns out that these two things were kind of connected. So Tom was like the superhero of this whole exciting story. In a reported speech, Stratton also conveyed that he had always held the belief that his actions were a step towards eventual legalization of Zaza. He explained that they were well aware the claims of Reefer Madness were baseless and the figures like Harry Enslinger, who led the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, later becoming the DEA, were propagating false narratives about this beautiful green plant being diabolical. Stratton continued stating that the Vietnam War played a pivotal role in changing his perceptions, saying many veterans who might not have otherwise encountered Zaza began using it in Vietnam. Upon their return, they actively joined the movement to advocate for Zaza legalization. Furthermore, individuals involved in anti-war activism often indulged in this plan, and they later became leaders in the campaign against the war on drugs. When asked if his involvement in Zaza smuggling was primarily driven by profit like many other dealers, Stratton emphasized that his motivations were not solely financial. He clarified that had Zaza been illegal, he would not have pursued such activities. Instead, his primary drive was rooted in political and cultural reasons not criminal intent. He highlighted that he didn't engage in bank robberies, extortion, or the smuggling and distribution of harder drugs like H or C. His actions were more akin to those of an outlaw challenging a set of laws that many believed were unjust, hypocritical, and more harmful than the plant itself. It was in essence a mission to transform perceptions of the plant and rectify what he saw as an injustice. He also stated that to him, Zaza holds a unique meaning it acts as a liberator of thought processes, opening up the mind to new possibilities. And when people use it, their preconceived notions about life often undergo a transformation. Some may become paranoid while others become more creative, but the common thread is that it alters their outlook. He describes Zaza as an enigmatic plant with a deep and intricate connection to humanity. He wanted to describe the Zaza legalization movement as a powerful metaphor for the functioning of American democracy. In his view, it symbolized the essence of living in a participatory democracy where Americans have a duty to question authority. 
And he emphasizes that it's not enough to unquestioningly accept what the government dictates as good or bad for the people and the nation or how they should lead their lives. Instead, it serves as a reminder of the importance of an active engagement in a democratic society. After all, quote, my primary motivation for me was to keep America high and thereby defy the government's drug laws and prove them as wrong and dishonest. We were activists, and through that, we realized the government was lying about Zaza, and that led us to disbelieve so much of what they had told us about race, about the war in Vietnam, about political assassinations, and about the war on drugs. And ultimately, as time has been proven, we were right. They were lying. It's all connected, he said, end quote. In all, Stratton was a believer in disrupting the status quo, and he didn't just disrupt, he became an active identifier of the names that will go down in history as those who made an impact on the Zaza journey in America. And this right here, folks, is a story I think is so important to know because Stratton was one of these individuals that understood the power of this plant and how mind-altering substances, while yes, they can be abused just like anything, there is a definite benefit to taking someone's mindset and putting it into another mindset. I think being open to change, being open to view things differently, it's a plus, it's a good thing, it's important. You don't wanna get stuck in your ways. And like I said, a lot of these smugglers that we talk about in the Trap Tree series, these are people that understand that this plant is just a lens to look at broader issues in the United States and our world. Defying the government is important. It's kind of what makes us Americans, right? Anyways, thank you so much for watching the Trap Tree series. If you guys are interested in potentially working with me, I'm looking for editors, I'm looking for writers. I'm looking for a number of other spots to fill. So please don't hesitate to send me an email, DM me, all that stuff. Let me know, send me a resume, what you wanna do. I got a lot of spots opening up for a different, couple different series I'm working on. So don't hesitate to reach out. Anyways, please make sure to hit the like button, share this and comment down below. And don't forget to follow me on all the social medias. The links are down below in the description. Big shouts out to Mr. Stratton, an absolute legend in American smuggling history. Anyways, this is LMC, signing out. Yay!